So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dan Igor Rudnansky. He'll give us uh, the second Zablotsky lecture today. The third one will be on Thursday. Logically the first. Logically the first, I suppose. Um, okay, so let me just quickly recall what we were doing uh, last time, um, and then close sort of that that avenue off in in a few minutes. So um, so it turns out that there is a formal connection between the nonlinear Schrodinger equation of this particular kind. And the, uh, so this is MLS, and the compressible Euler equations no, actually, this was phi. This is compressible. And the formal connection, formal connection was established by looking at the solution of the Schrodinger equation in a particular form, which is square root of rho e to the minus i psi. And it turns out that then, if you rewrite the first equation, if you rewrite NLS in terms of the equations for rho and t, it looks very, very similar to compressible Euler, modular numerical constants, and modular the fact that the second equation picks up an extra term, which is called quantum pressure. Okay. So basically, you get the same thing here, except that, well, use a different chalk, different color. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is also there. So uh, you get the term here, which is Laplace square root of rho divided by uh, square root of rho. And okay, like I said, some numerical factors as well. Um, okay. The uh, moreover, so gamma, there is a correspondence between the uh, the equation of state of this polytropic constant gamma and the power of the nonlinearity uh, p that we see in the NLS. So this this correspondence is very precise. Sort of the property of the gas corresponds to the property of the um, uh, corresponding exponent in in the NLS. Okay, now, the strategy then, or the idea was that, well, if you look at the similarity group here, this group here is R plus, there's nothing else. So the only possibility to rescale your solutions is a one parameter family, one parameter group, if you want. On the other hand, here, it just so happens, we can do it by very simple examination, that here the group is R plus times R plus, so it's twice as good. So why is that the case? Well, the, that's the case because there is not a precise correspondence. There is this error term. And so in particular, if you apply this transformations to uh, this, this term, right, to the original Schrodinger equation, it does not preserve the equation itself. It changes it. But more or less, the only term that it changes is this term. Okay. So that's sort of what breaks. This term breaks this group and reduces it to this group. So then the idea is that, well, we want to look at this reduction. We still want to, it's un, sort of unreasonable to work with R plus times R plus. We want to work with R plus. So we want to quotient to R plus, but not in this way. We don't want to reduce it to this way. We want to reduce it to something else. Okay. So reduce this again to R plus. And you can think that in the process of this reduction, or these reductions are all parameterized by simple parameter, which I'm going to call R. Okay. So that's it's a sequence of reductions, or rather family of reductions, and I'm param parameterizing the, by this parameter R. And then I can see how, um, so 
OK. All right, so we do this, and then we look at the, um, look at the family of rescalings. So rescale solutions of Erlen. So there is this parameter lambda that is supposed to go to 0. We rescale, and we look on how this extra term will behave relative to this parameter r, which labels our reduction. Okay. And it turns out that, well, it's very clear. There is, a, there is a value of parameter r for which this term does not change. That corresponds to precisely this reduction. In general, it will depend on r. And it turns out, and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but more or less, you can think that the, what, the way it happens is that this term will pick up a factor of lambda to the power r. When r is equal to 0, that corresponds to this, does nothing. When r is positive, that uh, has the property that this term will go to 0 when lambda goes to 0. When r is negative, it has the property that this term becomes very big as lambda goes to 0. So the point is then the following, that if we can find we choose R positive. We look at this reduction. If we can find a self-similar solution of Euler for that particular value of R, then if we use that solution to plug it into the Schrodinger equation, it will have the property that this extra term that Schrodinger kicks out will go to zero. And therefore, the self-similar solution of Euler will be an approximate solution of our original Schrodinger equation. That's the strategy. So then what would be left to do? Well, there are two things to do. So step one, find self-similar solutions. Find self-similar solutions of Erlen. Step two, uh, stability. Well, one is sort of self-explanatory, and I'll come back to it in a second. Two is a little bit more mysterious. So what is this stability? Why do you need to do anything? Well, the idea is that, OK, you, suppose that you found, you achieved, you succeeded in step one. You found the self-similar solution of Erlen. If you plug it in into the Schrodinger equation, it gives you a, an approximate solution of Schrodinger. Well, we need an exact. If we want to prove that something blows up in time, finite time, if we want to construct an example, at least one example, we need to find an exact solution. So how does one find exact solutions if one has an approximate solution? Well, you think of it as solving an inhomogeneous equation with something on the right-hand side, which goes to 0. And then from that, you want to construct an exact solution. And that basically amounts to proving stability, to showing that if you look at the neighborhood of, that, of something which is close to being a solution, then in that neighborhood, you can find an exact solution. Um, that's not automatic. That's tricky. Because, of course, here, things are blowing up. So you're trying to find something. You're trying to prove stability in the neighborhood of something which is actually wants to form a singularity. And moreover, as it turns out, there are actually finitely many unstable directions. So you have to, it's not that you can just pick something and uh, everything converges to, to what you want. You need to fine tune to what you, what, what, how, to, how, to, how you perturb it. OK. All right. So, I'm probably not going to say more about this, but you know, okay, if you have any questions, I can explain a little more. So this is that part. It, it's not easy to do uh, conceptually and technically, but, but maybe a little bit more interesting part is part one, because that has some history as well. Yeah. So stability is, of course, not true for the, like, if you write down some random flow of radius like this, you will not be getting it. So what's specific about here that allows you to prove this stability? To prove stability. Um, well, so the, there are two statements here. So the first statement is that you prove sort of finite codimension. That helps. So you only prove finite codimension stability. So in other words, um, so if you look uh, in your, at your picture, then you know you might have some trajectories which will go away, they're unstable, uh, and you want to control them, so you want to, you want to not pick those, go, those directions, and you'll have some directions which will converge. And the goal here, it would have been enough to actually find just one stable direction. Um, 
what turns out is that you can find actually only finitely many unstable directions. But the fact that you only need to prove it up to finitely many uh, finite co-dimensions helps. However, the main reason why you are able to prove stability is the property of that particular self-singular solution of earlier that you found. It's not a generic property. It's not like if you found some function or if you found some solution, then automatically it would be stable. Uh, it's actually a certain monotonicity property of the self-singular solution that, that, that we find that guarantees this stability. It's a stupid question. Yeah. Stability yes. Or actually both. Uh, in fact, even more than that. But yes, so it's for this, it's for this, and it turns out that it's actually, um, you can even do compressible Navier stocks in that case. So you can even add viscosity to this equation, and you can still show that that solution of earlier that you found is stable enough to guarantee blow up for the compressible Navier stocks. Another stupid question. I mean, this is not the general oil. This is oil without any kind of turbulence. So that's funny. This, in some sense, compressible early is the most general case because the incompressible early corresponds to constant density. Constant density, and then you add the, instead of the, adding the equation of state, you add the incompressibility condition, which means that divergence of, of the velocity field is equal to zero. Now, this has nothing to do with the incompressible case because I'm assuming that the flow is irrotational. It's incompatible with the assumption that it's divergence-free. You'd get simply nothing in that case. Uh, so, yes, uh, this is not the regime where you expect to see turbulence, right? This is not that. Uh, because instead, instead in, in, well, instead it's a different regime. And I'll talk about this in a second. Well, I'll tell you how to, um, what's the history behind this uh, self-similar solutions for early. Um, right. So now, one word about stability. So I told you that in some sense it amounts or... Um, is largely, what's largely responsible for that stability is the property of the particular self-similar solution that we find. The trick, though, or the challenge is that we don't find it in, its, in exact form. We don't know. It's not written down. We just prove existence. And then we have to deduce certain monotonicity properties, which will then, in turn, show that there is stability. Okay. That's the strategy. Now, what's the story here? So the story here is very interesting and a very old one. It actually goes back to a 1942 paper uh, by a German physicist named Gooderly. Then a 1945 paper of a Russian physicist named Sedov. And then around the same time, uh, a British physicist named Taylor. And then the list continues. Now, you, you, you may... Um, Notice an interesting um, coincidence with, with, with years, with dates. What, is this, what was this all about? Uh, why, were they, why was a German physicist doing this in 42? Why was a, a Russian physicist doing this in 45? A British citizen uh, uh, physicist in 45 as well? Um, uh, the mystery is resolved very simply. They were looking for uh, models for um, explosions. Because what the self-similar solution of compressible Euler models is one of the, uh, let's say, one of the models or one of the phenomena that is modeled by it is an exploding, exploding gas. So exactly what happens in the process of specifically, let's say, nuclear explosion. Okay. Um, so, right. And the idea, okay, so how, if you want to model it, it's the same principle. It's too difficult to solve this, and it's not needed to solve this. You want to look for particular solutions. You assume that maybe the phenomena is going to be, in some sense, self-similar. You also assume that you are in a regime where it's a self-similar behavior with the property that it becomes very violent. In other words, uh, things blow up, literally blow up. Um, and then you try to construct the solutions because then you can, you can try to model it, and you can try to measure it. You can understand for which, uh, let's say, equations of state that happens, what is the energy released in the explosion, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this, this were the first papers that did all of this analysis. Um, and what they realized is something quite interesting. So they show that you can take these equations. You have the similarity group uh, acting on them. You can do this reduction the way I said, parameterized by this parameter r. Uh, and then you can start looking for self-similar solutions, which I told you reduce to something elliptic, vaguely elliptic generally speaking. 
But you can make one more assumption. You can make an assumption that um, your, let's say, your solution is rotationally symmetric. So what, how many variables are then left? Well, t is in, eliminated by the assumption that you have some similarity. And then the only, thing, the only variable that's left is the uh, radial variable. So it becomes a system of two equations in one variable. And um, well, that's, these are ODEs. And it turns out to be a system of, of two ODEs. And well, if you're lucky, and Gooderly was lucky because he realized that there is a way, there is a transformation that will make the system of ODEs to be autonomous. So you end up with a system of two ODEs which are autonomous, and you can draw a face portrait for the system. And once you draw a face portrait, you can more or less draw solutions on it. Uh, and this is, this is how the subject started. And then it sort of continued, and people understood there is a huge library of self-similar solutions of early equations, which are done exactly, constructed exactly like this. You draw a face portrait, and I, Principle, you can, it's not difficult to draw this face portrait. Um, well, let me not do this because I probably won't tell you much. But and read off the solutions. Yeah. Yes. Ah. Yeah. So. So you can sort of view it. So, um, so it depends on which direction in time. So actually what we are interested in, we're interested in the sort of running the time in the opposite direction because we're interested not in the explosion but the implosion. Okay. And so what does, what, what does the implosion do? So if you draw the picture here, let's say that you have something is happening exactly at this point, then so you have this property. So you have pressure acting here, and you have velocity. So you have pressure, you have velocity, uh, u, and you have density. So what makes your gas collapse is you have denser gas outside, lighter gas inside, so the pressure is collapsing it, and at the same time, you're also giving it velocity, and you turn velocity inward, so that it also it helps you, it goes in. Okay. So there is no there there is no right hand side. There are no forces. This is all internal. But the idea with the uh, with the implosion is that you um, the pressure is acting from the uh, from the outside in, and the velocity is also going from the uh, outside in. Okay. So all the gas goes to one point. No, 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 no. So literally, this is what happens with the gas. This is the initial configuration of the gas. You have a cloud of, uh, you have a cloud of gas, um, let's say at some negative time, and it just collapses in, collapses to a point, and when it collapses to a point, at that particular point, the density, the density of that gas becomes infinite because all the gas collapsed to one point. You compressed it to one point. This is not the explosion. In the explosion, it's what happens after that. It's released. Okay. So that's sort of uh, the explosion is what happens if you if you do this, or if you reverse that. And is the uh, uh, trend of symmetry yeah. stable, or do you not care about it? Is it looking for a? That's a very good point. Um, so it's 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 not an easy question. Okay. So it's unclear whether spherical symmetry is stable or not. Um, and it's unclear even sort of at, at the physical level because it's always been modeled by, by basically spherically symmetric explosions uh, or spherically symmetric phenomena. And okay, some things were done numerically, but... So I think the likeliest answer here is that you, it's not stable. You might, so for instance, this finite co-dimension stability, you might have to start removing extra directions of instability when you remove spherical symmetry. Okay, so now, right, so you might look at this literature and say, well, you, everything's done already, so you can just pick one of those self-similar solutions that people constructed and use it. Um, there's one caveat, though. You can't use any of the solutions. 
And the reason is that I just want to recall what I said at the very beginning of the lecture, is that what you need to, in order to use this for this is a profile, in other words, a self-similar solution, which is uh, a self-similar profile, which has the property that it's smooth and it decays at infinity. Okay. Um, what about this self-similar solutions? In particular, what, if you think about, let's say, the explosion, um, what kind of self-similar solutions in, uh, arise in that case? Well, what arise in that case are solutions with shocks in them already. Okay. So this cloud of gas, for instance, which would be relevant for implosion or explosion, is characterized by the fact that when you look, for instance, at the initial density, the initial density uh, is, let's say, something, with, for instance, one here, but then it jumps to zero. So it has discontinuities already in the initial data. And it's perfectly fine for modeling explosions and other phenomena, but it's not fine for us because uh, we don't want solutions which become non-smooth. We're not interested in shocks. We're interested, we're interested in this phenomena, but in such a way that it's not, we also want it not to be accompanied by a shock. That's very important. Because shock is a completely different, it's a different phenomena of, of compressible fluids. We're interested in something else. So, and it turns out that this is a more general phenomenon. Uh, that if you look at this literature of about 80 years of work in, uh, in compressible fluids on self-similar solutions, then all of them, all of those solutions are, whether they're half shocks or not, they're all non-smooth. And there's sort of a reason for it. So, non-smooth profiles. Shocks or no shocks, but they're all non-smooth. Uh, interestingly enough, that it's not difficult to show that you can always construct. So suppose that you give yourself, um, so you can just make the following statement. For any k, there is always, let's say, a ck solution. Okay. So you have solutions with shocks, fine. You have solutions which are C1, fine. You can even prove that if you give yourself any integer, you can always construct the CK solution. Again, sounds like good news. And again, this is easy. And this can be done for any parameter R, if you remember what that is. But it turns out that it's not suitable. And the reason is very bizarre. The reason says that basically the following, that, well, if you take the solutions, it's CK. And then you go back here and you say, how much do I need for, to prove stability? And it turns out that you need CK plus one. So for any CK solution, you always want that solution to be one uh, derivative more regular in order to prove stability. So these solutions cannot be used. They exist, but they cannot be used. So then... Uh, no, exactly. Exactly, it's not. It's not, right. No, this is, this is a global solution. So, so essentially what happens, okay, let me just try to draw a face portrait for you, basically. So if you draw a face portrait, then there is, in this port, face portrait, there is something very important, which is called, think of it of this, uh, this way, that you um, end up as, Looking at the system is a delta. So system of two ODEs for A and B, two functions. Delta 1, delta 2, and delta. It turns out that in this case, they are polynomials in A and B. Okay. So um, there is this line, which is called the sonic line. This is the line where the denominator, delta, vanishes. So this is where delta is equal to zero. And as you know from your theory of ODEs, you cannot cross such a line. However, what you need to construct a global solution of this ODE, which is what we need, is that you need a solution which, which connects this point and the point at infinity. So you need something like this. This is the solution that you need. And, well, you can't cross this line. 
However, there is an exception. It's true that you cannot cross the line where delta is equal to zero, except for the points where also delta one is equal to zero and delta two is equal to zero. And it turns out in this particular regime, there are actually two such points. There is one here and there is another here. So you can make your solution go through this point. And so what's easy is to show that you can always construct a solution that goes like this to this point, and you, you can always construct a solution that goes like this. So that's juncture. That's the solution is at least continuous. Then you start examining. You blow up the neighborhood of this point, and you do basically Lyapunov analysis in this point. And well, you can again show that for any k, you can construct the ck solution. But Lapunov theorem more or less tells you that you can never construct the C infinity solution in this case. And um, so the non-smoothness all comes from just one point. Everywhere else, it's completely nice and acceptable. But it's all about this point. And it actually has, this point has a very precise physical meaning as well. What is the physical meaning of this point? Uh, the physical meaning of this point is that this has something to do with, so if you look at this, this picture, this is, so um, you can look, so this is the point of where everything blows up. And you can look at the backward sonic cone from this point. Okay, so um, that's precisely why this is called the sonic line. So this is the sonic cone. And it turns out that what, what happens is that you, you're trying to construct the initial data such that it, <coughs> So the, the, the self-similar solution always has a breakdown of regularity exactly at the point where the uh, backward sonic cone intersects the initial data. All right, so, um, so the, the, one of the main theorems in this is that, is what I was telling you last time, which is that um, there exists discrete sequence of values of R such that for each such value, there exists a C infinity solution. So everything that I said so far applied for any value of parameter R. But now you can quantize, so to speak, or discretize this parameter R in order to, there's sort of a selection principle which tells you that for specific values of R, you can fine tune it to find a C infinity solution. And one, yeah. And then you sort of, uh, I mean, when you have two parameters, yeah. you can accept that you can go to empty tree and the relationship. Yeah. Right. Right? But choosing R really means that you're, uh, you want to the Right. Yeah, exactly. So R completely determines everything. Yeah, precisely. Um, now, the important thing here is that not only can you find such a sequence, but that sequence is exactly in the re regime which you want, which is R positive, because we want it to be in a regime where this term goes to zero. So now you can put everything together. You can take this solution, it's now C infinity, so therefore it's uh, not a problem as far as stability goes. It has the needed regularity of stability, and take the solution, it turns out to, you can prove certain monotonicity properties of the, about the solution, and then you can use it for stability. So that's, that's, that's how, it, in principle, that's how it works. Um, okay. So if there are no questions about this, then I can switch to the other example. Okay. So the other example comes from a different direction, very different direction. So that's um, naked singularities. In general. So let me give you a, a two minute primer on what general relativity is and what, what's a singularity in general relativity. So this shouldn't be too difficult. <coughs> So four-dimensional manifold with a metric G on it. Um, the metric is Lorentzian. So think local model for such a metric is Minkowski space 
So it's a metric which has this form. That's a Lorentzian metric, right? And then um, the, the manifold itself and the metric itself, they should satisfy the Einstein equations. And uh, if you look at the vacuum equations, it basically tells you that the Ricci curvature should be equal to zero. That's the equation. If you have matter, then there is some right-hand side here. And I'll give you an example. I don't want to go into that. But the basic, prop the basic principle is that we're looking for Ricci flat uh, manifolds, which are Lorentz. Now, unlike the Riemannian counterpart, so you can, of course, you can always often hear about Einstein manifolds. And when people talk about Einstein manifolds, they actually mean Ricci flat or Ricci equals lambda g, uh, but in Riemannian signature. Okay. Now, in the Lorentzian signature, the problem has an, sort of an extra interesting flavor, which is that you should think of it as an initial value problem. Okay. So you should not, you should try to construct your manifold. How do you construct a manifold? Well, I'm only going to be interested in the situations which are relevant to gravitation collapse. So for me, I'm always going to think that I have an basically R3, which is embedded inside M M4. So that's the surface of my initial data. That's my R3. This is where the initial data is given to me. And what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to extend this initial hypersurface embedded into a larger manifold M4, and this extension has to be done in such a way so as to make the manifold reach you flat. Yes, and but also the second fundamental form of the embedding. Yeah, so there are two pieces of initial data. They don't have time like direction. Say that again? They don't have time like direction. Yes, so this is, if you want, this is the time like direction, right? You don't always have a T coordinate. Yeah, so this is a vast simplification, indeed. But locally, you can think that you have a T coordinate. It's okay. At least if you're interested in the local extension of this manifold, then you can certainly parameterize. You can introduce a T coordinate. The tricky part becomes when you're trying to extend this globally, which is what you want to do. Because given initial data, okay, you might be happy with the answer that you know you lived a, a little bit, but you want to know if you're going to live forever. Right? And so you want to understand sort of the boundary of what happens. So you try to extend maximally and see what happens. If the, if the manifold has to end, if it becomes incomplete, as it, for instance, it often does in Riemannian geometry, or if there's something else that ha happens. So that's something else that happens. So incompleteness can happen for many different reasons, it, uh, some of which have nothing to do with singularities. Again, in Riemannian geometry, that's a similar phenomena. You, all you can do, for instance, is that you can draw a manifold. You can remove a point from that manifold. And even though nothing happens, your manifold became incomplete. Right? So um, the point is that you can legitimately ask, in this process, as you ex keep extending this manifold further and further and further, what are you going to encounter? Are you going to encounter any singularities? And we know the answer to that question. The answer is yes, you will encounter singularities. Because we actually have explicit examples that show that. So for instance, Schwarzschild spacetime, a black hole spacetime, will have a property that once you, well, you extend it, you will encounter uh, a black hole region inside which there is a singularity. And that singularity is actually a curvature singularity. So curvature blows up. Okay. So we know, we knew for a long time, although maybe not as long you might, as you might think, but that's a separate story. So, the Schwarzschild solution had been uh, written down in 1915, but people did not understand that it corresponded to uh, a singularity uh, for about maybe 30 years. Nonetheless, so singularities do exist. Singularities exist or may appear, however you uh, want to phrase it, but what we know explicitly are that they're contained sort of inside black holes. And if they are contained inside, inside black holes, then that's, in principle, that's very good news because nothing, since nothing escapes from a black hole, such a singularity is completely contained. In particular, it's not visible. So physically speaking, it's not visible, visible to observers which stay outside the black hole, right? So 
from as far as as far as physics is concerned, this scenario is very desirable because we think of ourselves as living outside the black hole, and as such, if we don't go inside the black hole, we will never encounter in singularity. So physics is fine. Yes. Right. So. Um, well, I told you, I promised you a two-minute primer, so that cannot be said in two minutes. But basically, the idea is the following. I'm going to need this for later anyway, so let me just explain. So in Minkowski space, in Lorentzian metrics, they are characterized, they're different from Riemannian metrics in the sense that they have um, um, sort of tangent space can be split into three separate components. The component where directions are space-like, where the metric is positive, the component where the metric is negative, and the final component on the boundary, which is where the metric is zero. So this is so-called null directions. Okay. And the way that you can picture it, that at any point in, on, on your, of your manifold, you can draw a tangent space. And the tangent space is split into these components according to whether you look um, sort of this picture of, of a cone. So these are your space-like directions here. These are your time-like directions here. And these are the, on the boundary, these are your null directions. Okay. Like this. So that's in the tangent space. Now, in, in the space itself, you can draw, I'm talking about Minkowski space now. So you can draw a sphere. So let me draw, draw it as a circle, but it's actually, this is S2. And then at, the, at each point of S2, you can do the following. You can pick a null direction. There are two preferred null directions. One, which is called outgoing. Um, so it's null, and it's orthogonal to the sphere S2 itself. That's why it's unique. And the other one is incoming, like this. And what you can do is that you can infinitesimally deform your sphere in the outgoing or the incoming direction. Right? So for instance, if I deform it in the outgoing direction, then I see this happens. If I uh, in, uh, deform it in the incoming direction, then this will happen. Notice the form that while you deform it in the outgoing direction, the area increases. And when you deform it in the ingoing direction, the area decreases. That's the basic property of Minkowski space. What happens in general, and that's exactly what happens in sort of this in the process of gravitation collapse, is that your gravity, your geometry, your curvature can become so strong that the area will decrease regardless of whether you deform it in the outgoing or incoming directions. And if that happens, so that, that's no longer a correct picture, I, you'd have to redraw it, such a surface is called trap. So black hole, in the way, one way to think of a black hole, or to think of about black holes, is the following: that in the process of developing your initial data, the curvature have become so strong, so large in some region, so that there is a whole region here in the future somewhere. So this region, where each point, so each point for me here is now S two where each S2 is trapped. It's a trap surface. So I have a whole region of trap surfaces. Now, notice the following. Notice that, OK, so there's a trap, which means that the area does not decrease. So think that, how does light propagate? Light propagates exactly along the null directions. So it means that all the light that has ended up in this region, it has to stay in this region. It can never escape from it. So this whole region populated by trapped surfaces is sort of self-contained. So therefore, the complement of that region has the property that if you, it, not, it does not see any information, it does not receive any information from this region. So this region is the black hole. The boundary, which separates the two, is called the event horizon. And a lot of the black holes, they end in the singularity. So at the end of it, it's the curvature keeps becoming larger and larger and larger, and then it blows up here. Okay. So that's a black hole. And that's the singularity that sits inside the black hole. And as a result, it's covered up from us who live here. Yeah. OK. So that's sort of a pseudo, well, semi mathematical way of describing this. Um, so what is not desirable? What is not desirable is to get what's called a naked singularity. So the question, the big question um, that plagued, to some extent, this area is the existence of naked singularities. 
what's a naked singularity? That's a singularity that is visible to outside observers. So it just so could it happen, for instance, that instead of curvature blowing up here, where it's covered up and it's, it's sort of preceded by trapped surfaces, that instead the curvature somehow miraculously blew up here at an isolated point in the region which is not covered up and therefore visible. So for instance, if I, ha if I have an observer, then this observer would actually end up in the singularity in finite time. And physics basically ends at this point. So, yeah. So what do you mean is that the thing that you don't want is that you don't want to have a solution going to now this direction from the emission data to a singularity, right? Yes. Well. Because the precise statement, if you'd like, is that you do not want existence of points with the following property, that if you take such a point and you draw, this is going to be difficult, but let me draw it. You draw a backward null cone from this point, okay? So like this. Then this region, well, it's, okay. So you draw a backward null cone from this point and you draw a forward light cone from this point. So a naked singularity is a singularity with the property that if you look at this whole region, that in this whole region there is not a trapped surface. Because if, if there was a trapped surface, then it would tell you that this point is actually not here, but here. Okay. But if there is no trapped surface, which precede, precedes in this sense this point, then that's a naked singularity. But yeah, so in particular, you would have a null direction coming from a new, your initial data, which runs into singularity. Yeah. Okay, so do they exist? So this problem for in vacuum had been open until last year. Okay. However, there was some partial evidence that um, they do, they should exist, and the partial evidence came from the fact that. Uh, people try to model it with matter. 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 They added matter. They changed the equation. Um, okay. So, let me see. All right. So, adding matter. So, this is basically the work of Christodoulou. Well, there were two different kinds of work, but I'm just going to describe one instance because there are two, ma there's, you can add what's called the null dust. In that case, sort of the existence of naked singularities was known, uh, but it's not a very good physical matter. So I'm just going to describe something which is basically around 1990, the work from around 1990, where he added what's called the scaly field to the, uh, to the matter model. And that's basically changing the equation like this. So instead of solving r alpha beta is equal to zero, you solve the equation of this kind. Okay, so you add an extra scaly field, function phi. And then you basically, you add another equation. And that equation is very simple. It's just a wave equation with respect to the metric G that solves this. So you have coupling. This is the system. Yes, right. Well, so, okay, technically speaking, what I should have written down is the Einstein tensor, and on the right-hand side, I should have written the energy momentum tensor of corresponding to the scalar field, but it's equivalent to this. Okay. And uh, the box is the Laplacian and the Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's a Laplacian. Of course, it's not Riemannian, right? It has a, it's, it's a wave character. Yeah. Right, so the, it's analogous to the minus dt squared plus Laplace, except that you replace everything. It has now variable coefficients, which depend on the metric G. Okay, so it's really a wave equation. Okay. What is the motivation? So let me tell you what, okay. So he wanted to, so he, he studied this whole model from beginning to the end, and he proved the amazing results for this model. And one of those results was existence of naked singularities for this model. One of the main reasons why one wants to study this model is that it's the simplest model that you can study with, with matter. Scalar field, nothing can be simple. Okay, null dust is a little simple, but it's the basic, one of the basic models. But let me tell you the, the very, very dirty secret why. 
What is the reason? Why are you making this equation more difficult instead of studying this equation? Why are you adding extra, extra matter? And the dirty secret is the following, that, OK, this is, a, this is an equation in four dimensions. It has four variables. We would like to reduce this to an ODE. Because what can be simpler than an ODE? How does one get, arrive to the ODE? Well, the same way that we, uh, we did in the previous talk, well, actually this talk, first, you can try to impose self-similarity. That reduces one degree of freedom. And then you can impose spherical symmetry. Or if you want, don't impose self-similarity. Just impose spherical symmetry. Spherical symmetry, that's the action of the group of SO3. That kills two degrees of freedom. Okay. So what we want to do is that we want to start quotient. So the first quotienting that we want to do is we want to basically quotient by the, by the action of SO3. And write down the corresponding equations. And now it becomes a, a one plus one dimensional system of PDEs. And that's very simple. Yes? Well, SO3 can be a magical that you jump to the unknown. Of course. Exactly. Yes. So it means that your geometry is invariant with respect to the action of SO3. Your unknown geometry, as you said correctly, your unknown geometry is invariant under the group of the action of SO3, which means that the, the it reduces to the unknown geometry in dimension one plus one, well, in dimension two. And as long as you can construct that two-dimensional geometry, then you can lift it up to the full geometry, which will be invariant under SO3. That's, that's the precise meaning. OK, so the whole reason why you want to so you, you want to quotient by SO3 because you want to uh, reduce the number sort of your PD to one plus one dimensional one. The problem with this is that there is a theorem of Virgo, which tells you that there is a complete rigidity. In this dimension, any uh, the only solutions of this equation under the symmetry are basically Schwarzschild solutions. There is no dynamics left. Okay. So you have rigidity. So, so you, you screwed. <laughs> and you can unscrew yourself by doing this. You just add matter. You add an additional degree, add an additional unknown. And now the rigidity of Birgov is violated. It's no longer the case. You still, this is dynamic. It's one plus one dimensional PDE, but there is no longer rigidity. Okay. So now, what you do now is that you also add the action of R plus. And by simple counting, right? So if you're looking for, so now I'm looking for naked singularities. And it turns out that a naked singularity, exactly of the type that I described, can be thought of, or can be, you can try to find it by looking for self-similar solutions, which again, as before, is an additional action of R plus. And what are you going to get in this case? You're going to get a system of ODEs. But before I tell you about that, I need to tell you what is the definition of self-similarity, right? Because in the beginning of the talk, I promised to give you a geometric notion of self-similarity. Because there is no T and X like before. What is the action of R plus in this case? How to properly define it? Because that's, that's interesting in itself. So, so what is the similarity or self-similarity? So it's understood as follows. We try, we're going to understand it infinitesimally. So, it's the existence of a vector field K on M. So, if you want, it's a section. This. So this is a vector field K with the following very simple property that if you compute the lead derivative of your metric G, which is unknown, of course, with respect to K, then you get twice G itself. That's what self-similarity means. If you can find a vector field uh, K on your manifold with the property that its lead derivative acts on G in this form, then G, and of course G satisfies your equation, then such G will be self-similar. So what is this K typically? How should you think of this K? For instance, Minkowski space is self-similar. 
And what is the corresponding vector field that acts on it? It's simply TDT plus x dot gradient. Okay. It makes sense. I mean, Minkowski space is self-similar. It has every symmetry uh, possible. So in, in particular, scaling symmetry. So you can think of it, of course, at the level of transformations. But instead, you can think of it at the level of generators. And the thing in the, at the level of generators is much more, uh, it's much better because, well, in some sense, we only know our space time locally. So it's much better to think about it this way. So self similarity literally means existence of a vector field with this property. Now, you want to add a few assumptions on what this vector field K should be based on what you see, for instance, here. Is that there is one point, specific point, preferred point, where this vector field vanishes. Well, that's precisely where this, this self-similarity is based on. That's, if you want, that's going to be this point right here. That's the center of symmetry. Because it's, everything is sort of self-similar relative to that point. So there is one point where this vector field vanishes. And in, in Lorentzian geometry, there is also something interesting. There is, uh, this vector field has the following property, that there is a region where it's time-like, there is a region where it's space-like, and there is a region where it's null. It does not vanish, but its length vanishes. What is that region? Well, it's precisely sort of the null cone. On the null cone that comes out from this point, vector field K is null. So it's actually, par it's, it is literally null. So it's parallel to the generators. Okay. So we've given the, the geometric, now I claim, by the way, that the discussion from the previous lecture can be phrased in these terms as well. In other words, you can find a vector field with the property that when it acts on the solution, it transforms the solution in a, a certain way. So again, rather than transformations, you can shift it to the question about how generators of that transformation act. Okay, so we're looking for this, and we're looking for something spherically symmetric, and then what you end up with is the system of Poilies. And again, miraculously, Something, something interesting happens. It's a system of two IDEs, and they're autonomous, which means a face portrait. And that's exactly what Christian Dulu did. He was able to draw a face portrait, and he understood, he constructed global trajectories which had the desired properties, and constructed self-similar solutions. Two caveats. The caveat, the first caveat, is that I told you how K should act on G, but I didn't tell you how K should act on phi. It's natural to assume, it's natural to think that perhaps the way K should act on phi, well, I can write Li K if you prefer, is that it should simply be equal to zero. That's the natural scaling in the problem. But it turns out that in this case, there's complete rigidity. No, there are solutions, but they do not correspond to singular solutions. So, that's now I want to connect to the theme of these two talks. Christodoulou realized that there is a larger group acting on the space of solutions than R plus. But unlike the example that I was giving you previously, the larger group here is R plus times R. What is that group? So I'm going to say something completely trivial. Uh, and it might strike you that, uh, that, it's, that one should not be able to extract anything meaningful from that trivial statement. And the trivial statement is the following. So where is this R? Well, notice that I can simply replace phi by phi plus a constant. Because the only way phi enters into these equations is via its derivatives. So it doesn't see constants. So you can translate your solution by arbitrary constant. Does nothing. That's this R. So now, again, I want to reduce this. Well, he reduced this to R plus. There is a trivial reduction, of course, which gets you back to, to this. But there is a non-trivial reduction, which in his language is par parameterized by the parameter kappa, where instead of putting 0 on the right-hand side, you now put a constant. And that changes the picture completely. So what does it correspond to? It corresponds to, this reduction corresponds to shifting your solution, not by a constant, but literally by kappa times log t, if you want. 
that. I know that there is no large global coordinate t, so I'm lying here a little bit. But morally, this is what you do. And because, exactly because it's log t, you see that what happens is that you are building in that the scalar field is blowing up at the singularity. The singularity corresponds to t equals 0. So this is how he understood new type of self-singularity for this equation. And then in this case, rigidity is broken. The phase portrait actually produces non-trivial solutions, which correspond to the singularities, naked singularities. And the second caveat that I promised you, to you is that not only did he prove that, he also proved that the solutions are non-generic. They're unstable. And not just linear unstable, they're um, non-linearly unstable. In what sense? Exactly in the precise physical sense that you want. He showed that if you take such a solution and you perturb the initial data for that solution, then a trap surface will form before the singularity is achieved. Which means that effectively it shows you that if you perturb any perturbation, not any perturbation, but you understand. Non-generic means that there is a one parameter family of perturbations such that if you perturb in those directions, then this point effectively is going to end up in the trap region and physics is restored. And so this, well, even before that, there is a big conjecture in the area called the weak cosmic censorship conjecture which says the following. It says that naked singularities, they might be possible, but generically, they should not exist. And he proved weak cosmic censorship precisely for this model in spherical symmetry. And that was part of it. He showed that A, naked singularities are possible, but then he also showed that they're non-generic. So nonetheless, it left um, a huge open question, which was not resolved by this work, and that is, can naked singularities exist in vacuum? So the theorem I'm going to tell you. So that's the theorem due to Schlappenbach, Hoffman, and myself. And so the one part, and then the second part by him alone tells you that um, naked singularities exist in that. Um, okay. So. Okay, I have a couple of minutes to tell you why. So the big issue here is that by what I told you by Birhoff's theorem, you cannot reduce this to spherical symmetry, which means that you cannot reduce this to the theory of leads. So this has to come from something else, from somewhere else. And it's a little tricky to explain where it comes from, but I'll, I'll try in a, in a couple of minutes. The idea is we still want to look for a self-similar solution. It's just that when we look for that, we show existence of an approximately self-similar solution in the same way, in a similar way that, that I showed you in the previous talk. But in this case, we're not, I'm not going to find another equation and find a self-similar solution of another equation. I'm, go, I'm looking, I'm sticking with the equation. I'm looking for an approximately self-similar solution of my equation. Okay. But the question is, what does self-similarity mean? And again, I'm gonna try to use the, the same trick as before. I'm going to try to find a larger group, and, I try to, and I'm going to try to find a non-trivial reduction of that group. To explain, so we already, for instance, for instance, saw that it worked here. We found a larger group, and then we made a non-trivial reduction of that group and found a non-trivial <coughs> self-similar solution. This is what he did. Where do you find it in the absence of, let's say, spherical symmetry, in the absence of the, of the crutch that, that's provided by leads? The idea actually came from a uh, rather unlikely source, which I won't have time to explain. It has to do with pfefferman Graham's theory of conformal invariance. Okay. So if you give me five minutes, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to come to a logical conclusion, if that's OK. So this is uh, it's called pfefferman Graham theory of conformal invariance. And it's, it's a theory that was put forward in 85 and then sort of completed in, in 07. Nothing to do with general relativity. It has to do with a very simple question. You can take a Riemannian manifold. So let me lie, and I'm just going to specialize this immediately to the situation that I want. 
So you can take a Riemannian manifold and you can say, how can I classify conformal invariants on that manifold? Okay. Let me not explain to you what these are. <laughs> and the basic idea is that you want to reduce this problem to something easier. Instead of classifying conformal invariants, you want to classify diffeomorphism invariants. Okay. And the idea of Pfeffer and Graham is that you do it via what's called an ambient construction. Ambient construction means the following. So you take your Riemannian manifold, which I'm going to take, in this case, this Riemannian manifold will be S2. And I'm going to picture this S2. I'm going to think of, 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 of S2 as a point. So one point on the blackboard is S2. You can look, you can think of the uh, sort of, you fix a metric on S2, and then you look at all the conformal metrics to it. And it turns out the first part of the ambient metric construction, or ambient space construction, is that you realize this uh, family of metrics as actually a cone, okay? So because you basically what you're doing is that you're taking a given metric G bar on the Riemannian manifold, and you put a, a scalar factor in front of it. And so one manifold, it's sort of you realize this as a cone, where this point corresponds to u equals 0, and then this goes all the way to infinity. That's the first part. Now, it's a cone, but what's the metric on this cone? It's degenerate, because you're missing. So if, you, if this metric was non-degenerate, then you would have wanted to add this du squared, but you're not, you don't do that. So it's degenerate. And so Pfeffer and Graham then realized that, OK, I have a cone, which will help me to understand, to sort of realize all of my conformal metrics. But it's degenerate, and I don't want to work with degenerate metrics. So what you should think of it as a null cone embedded in a higher dimensional Lorentzian manifold. Because on null cones, the metric degenerates. It has zero length. So the second part, the ambient metric construction, first enlarges dimension by one, and then it enlarges dimension by two. So it goes to two dimensions higher. And then the pfeffer mandel gram the, uh, the, the, the idea behind the theory was that what you're going to do now is that you have now a degenerate metric given on the cone, and you're going to try to extend this metric to a neighborhood of this cone, like this, by what? By solving the equation Ricci of g is equal to 0. And when you look at this extension, then there's a formal claim which says the following, that diffeomorphism invariants of this extended manifold correspond to conformal invariants of your original manifold. And so this is the algorithm which tells you all conformal invariants of G uh, bar can be characterized by diffeomorphism invariants of this bigger metric G that you have to construct. Okay. Now, um, that's very good. What does it have to do with anything? Well, the good news is that you already see that reaching g is equal to 0 is emerging from here. The other good news is that this construction, by design, is self-similar. Not only does it give you reaching g is equal to 0, but it gives you a self-similar metric. And the design is exactly in this. You're building it in. That's this, this scaling invariance is precisely what allows you to, con to convert conformal invariance into diffeomorphism invariance. Very good, so you can say, well, they already did everything, so what else is there to do? Well, two things. First of all, they didn't do everything in the sense that they actually did not construct this extension. They, only, they were only able to show that uh, there is a formal power series which corresponds to this extension. They didn't show that there is a precise solution. Okay, we showed that there is a precise solution. You can prove that. But then we looked at this point and we realized that like in this example that I was giving you here, it corresponds to a non-singular point. So you may have constructed, well, okay. The other problem is that this solution is purely local. So you have to globalize it, but let's ignore that for a second. The bigger problem is that this point is not singular, it's regular. So it's like this problem where a couple is equal to zero. It's the wrong type of cell similarity. And that led us to, well, then two thoughts occurred. The first thought is that where are we losing here? Where is the extra degrees of freedom? And the extra degrees of freedom here is the group which has to do with the diffeomorphisms of S2. So let me draw a picture here. 
And that, that picture will probably be the last thing that I'll tell you. And the picture is the following. So here is my null cone from a singular point. So let me look at the full null cone. So this is, these are my spheres. This is my singular point. So these are, so these are null generators of this cone. Where is the self-similar vector field on this cone? Well, like in Minkowski space, the self-similar vector field it corresponds to the orbits of the self-similar vector field that are also null. And it just so happens that in pfefferman gram theory, they, are, they coincide with the null generators. But you can ask yourself a natural question. Does it really have to be that way? And the answer is no, it doesn't. And that's exactly where this diffeomorphism of this 2 comes from. So you can think of what does self-similarity do? It takes the sphere, and then it starts homothetically shrink the sphere to 0. But as you do that, you can also twist your sphere. So that means that what we, what we can do here is that we can add this, and then we can do a reduction, a non-trivial reduction to R plus again where you combine a diffeomorphism of S2 with the shrinking along the self-similar direction. And now you have to start thinking about how to choose this diffeomorphism of S2 advantageously. So it's that diffeomorphism parameter that in principle replaces this scalar parameter kappa in the construction of Christodoulou. And like in Christodoulou's case, it turned out that the non-trivial diffeomorphisms, they will break down this rigidity. Uh, when the diffeomorphism is trivial, this point is non-singular. The second that you add a twist, you can make this point singular. And then, okay, there is a completely separate story of then how to construct the global solution such that it gives you naked singularity, but that's, that's a separate. So that's, that's the idea. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, so why is it regular and why is it not singular? Uh, in, the, in the original construction. Um, it's not easy to explain, unfortunately. I mean, it's the same way it's not easy to explain, for instance, why in this case, when you put zero on the right-hand side, there is rigidity and it's not singular. But the basic idea is the following, that it turns out that when, when there is no twist, when, the, uh, when this vector field is completely parallel, then it turns out that inside this null cone, it's completely time-like, and outside it's completely space-like. And when it's completely time-like inside this null cone, you can there very easily show that the only solution that will exist inside the light cone is Minkowski space itself. There is nothing else. So the, what, it's only when you, you add a twist, you violate this idea that this region is completely time-like, and then the, your problem, okay, if you want, so under self-similarity, the inside of this problem looks like an elliptic problem. And an elliptic problem with more or less zero boundary conditions. And therefore, by sort of standard methods, okay, if you want unique continuation, you can show that there, the only solution there is a trivial solution. The second that you add a twist, you can show that this, uh, this, the self-similar vector field is not everywhere time-like inside. And when you do a self-similar reduction, it's not everywhere elliptic. Um, so as a result, you lose you lose rigidity. So you get more solutions. You get more solutions. Well, more importantly, you get a non-trivial solution, right? Other questions? How how does this different morphism of S two like? Just anyone that you choose, or is no. something very special? No, it's very special. Yeah. So. Um, So, okay, so more precisely, you can say the following, that it's very important, for instance, it's crucially important that that diffeomorphism does not correspond to the symmetry of S2 itself. So you have to basically bake in the fact that um, it has a non-trivial deformation tensor because it's the deformation tensor of that diffeomorphism on the metric on S2 that sort of drives this non-triviality of, the, um, um, of, 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 of this point, the this, this singular character of this point. So 
it's chosen. Yeah, there is flexibility in the way you choose that, but the main, the, the most important property of it is that the deformation tensor. Because for them, formulating a conjecture is something that settles the problem, not opens the problem. <laughs> and the conjecture says that the naked singularities are non-generic. And since they're non-generic, they feel free to do their physics, right? So they don't, it doesn't matter to them whether non, they're non-generic in the sense that they don't exist or they do exist, but they're unstable. To them, maybe that's, that's less of an of important issue. However, the existence of naked singularities in general has been a question for physicists. I mean, they were interested in this very much. And so in vacuum, yes, this is a very interesting question. What's open here is that we haven't proved that they're non-generic. Even the, the fact that these examples that we constructed, they haven't been proven yet. The, ex, the full expectation is that they are non-generic, but that's sort of, that's still being done. And now that we've shown that in principle, naked singularities are possible in vacuum, you can ask, is any naked singularity non-generic? Christodoulou was able to answer this question in spherical symmetry for this model. We don't know. That question is very far, very, uh, very much out of reach because that, so he, not only was he able to construct examples of uh, naked singularities, he was in some sense able to classify possible naked singularities. We constructed examples, we can't classify them in vacuum. Without spherical symmetry, it's, this is a very, very difficult problem. So to answer the question of, is any putative naked singularity non-generic, hard. And certainly from the point of view of physicists, they should very much care about this. It's just that at this point in time, uh, physicists care about, let's say, high energy physicists, if this is who we're talking about, they care about other aspects of gravity. They care about, let's say, uh, quantum gravity, quantum information. Uh, they care about ADS-CFT correspondence. Um, they, they don't particularly think about these issues. If we're talking about high energy physicists, not that I would want to, but. Let's thank you for that. Please continue with the local on Thursday, 2.30.